Are you sure you want to hear this? Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. When it comes to serial killers, it's never too soon to talk about motive. The nature of serial killers and serial killer cases is that their homicidal behavior can drag on for months, years and even decades, as they did in this case. The longer it takes to figure out what is going on, the more lives are at stake and the more lives that can be lost. So the moment you're looking at a serial killer scenario and you need to make certain that that is the case as well, but as soon as you are certain, what you want to do is drill down to motive as soon as possible because motive revealeth the man, why shows us who. Unusually for this channel, we've made little reference to the affidavit or the victims. Now that we're talking about motive, we will refer briefly to the affidavit. Once again, we don't want to do so gratuitously. Before we get to that, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do. If you're finding this analysis worthwhile, please like, share, leave a comment. You can also hit the thanks button and let's get started. So this is a screen grab of page 18 of the affidavit. And it is from the Thork email account associated with burner phone number 347-304-2671. It was used to conduct thousands of searches related to sex workers and um, porn. And obviously you can see that there's a lot of sadism in, this, in these searches. I've got to say I thought of the motive though of the Long Island serial killer. I thought it was quite clear early on. I'll be revealing that motive at the end of this analysis. Suffice it to say, these search terms, and obviously it's not an exhaustive list by any means, but I was unaware of those prior to determining motive, but they do support the original assessment. As I've said before, serial killers aren't the obscure psychological monsters many believe them to be. Their motives typically are quite banal in the criminal sense, which is to say, lacking in criminal originality, cliched, commonplace, and tawdry. From the search terms referenced in the affidavit, which ones repeat themselves, which ones stand out for a particular or common idiosyncrasy? While these, begging, torture, tied up, force-fed, beat up, painful, crying, all of these have a common theme of humiliation and sadism, Tied into their psychology, the focus of these varying grotesqueries remains the same. It's always targeted at females, girls. He gravitates to the inappropriately young, including pre-teens. This reveals both the seat and the extent of the killer's psychopathology. It's not surprising that the killer started with extreme fantasy and then, as with many addictions, wanted a greater sense of gratification which pushed him from online hypotheticals and fictional roles into the real world. On the FBI's official website, they describe serial killers thus, quote, Serial killers don't value human life and are extremely callous in their interactions with their victims. This is particularly evident in sexually motivated serial killers who repeatedly target, stalk, assault and kill without a sense of remorse, end quote. When we're dealing with a sexually motivated killer, as we are here, the killer doesn't see human prey as anything more than an object to satisfy a particular overwhelming desire at a particular time. Given that sexual desires are quite frequent, you can imagine what that leads to. It leads to several times simply trying to satisfy a particular overwhelming desire and each time at the cost of someone's life. And so it's because of their sexual addiction that they have so many victims. Take away the addiction and the driving force disappears. And then, so do the half dozen or dozen bodies littering a particular coastal highway. Now let's deal with serial killer motives in general. And I'm, I'm sharing this with you so that when you deal with the next serial killer case, you know how to think about it. So the motives of serial killers, again, aren't nearly as recondite, alien, or unknowable as many imagine, be because they repeatedly commit the same offense. 
It's the same addiction that's being satisfied every single time. And thus it follows a characteristic predictable behavior pattern. And so this pattern is essentially the motive. Let me say that again. Whether you look at one murder or a dozen, the motive is essentially the same. This means motive is relatively simple. If you want a succinct if you want to be succinct in your motive and you really do want to be that, with a serial killer you refer to the pattern, the series of crimes rather than any of the crimes individually. But conversely, one can look at an individual crime, perhaps the incident with the best evidence, the most human remains that were collected with the least amount of time going by, the greatest amount of fabric related to it, witnesses and so on, uh, cell phone communications or whatever. And um, if you've got a, enough with that, you can use that to extrapolate, to look into or to match to all the others. Now for a little bit of additional background. Without even looking at the face of this particular serial killer or his personality or any of the facets of this particular case, we can safely assume that a killer who feels compelled to repeat his crimes does so out of compulsion. And this in turn suggests some sort of addiction. And the really interesting part is, where does this addiction come from? What is it meant to compensate for? What is it? What emptiness or hollow space what hole was created and where? Unsurprisingly, statistically, almost a third of all serial killers kill for the enjoyment of it, which is to say for sexual satisfaction. There are also a large number of serial killers who kill for financial reasons. What is an interesting kind of inversion here is that in this case, the Gilgo Beach murders, you have the serial killer killing for enjoyment, but he uses financial reasons to lure his prey uh, into his web, right? So as you can see, there is a science to it and large, clear statistical samples. For example, according to one study, the average American serial killer is white. 82% are white. Operates alone. 87% operate alone. Is of average or superior intelligence. 80% tend to be smarter than average. And the motive is purely psychological, typically sadosexual. It's typically a psychological motive. And so how many of those stats match our suspect? In a different study, but one focused solely on sexually sadistic offenders like the Gilgo Beach serial killer, 74% had been emotionally abused themselves. Often the parental figures of serial killers conform to classic stereotypes as well. Maternal overprotection and infantilization, paternal neglect, the father may be cold, distant, authoritarian and punitive. And that then brings us to additional characteristics. A history of extreme cruelty to animals is common. The incidence of drugs and alcohol abuse is controversial, but some studies report an incidence as high as 50%. But it basically does tend to involve some kind of addiction to something, whether it's a substance, an addictive substance, or an addictive, um, an addictive, let's call it content. They often show an avid interest in various different things. Sometimes it's magic, sometimes it's monsters, sometimes it's torture, but particularly weapons. They tend to be very interested in weapons. Why do you think that is? Why do you think there's this unusual interest in having a lot of weapons around them? According to the same study, most experts in the field agree that these criminals are sexual sadists. And they define the sadism as the repeated practice of behavior and fantasy. And it's characterized by a wish to control another person through domination, humiliation, or inflicting pain for the purpose of producing sexual arousal. You can look at that paragraph, cross-reference it with the search terms that we dealt with earlier from the affidavit, and it's a perfect match. According to some sources, a typical trait of serial killers is a methodical killing style. In other words, because they are so methodical, and because they are so meticulous, arguably that's why they can get away with their crimes. 
also why they become serial killers. I mean, the nature of serial killing is it's methodical. It's the same thing repeated. What this also indicates is a, a very distinct, something that is very distinct from other criminals is a degree of detachment from their victims. They are so caught up in a fantasy world. They are so caught up in their addiction that they don't realize they're actually dealing with a human being. And so they are able to go through a checklist, go through the motions of their crime with cool precision, despite a scenario that would cause many other criminals to panic or lose concentration. How many of those characteristics again match our suspect in this case? Do you see why it's not really rocket science? Now, the first step to piecing together motive. When we're dealing with motive, we need to be as succinct and specific as possible. Ideally, a motive is one or two or three words. To test whether it's accurate, whether it fits the idiosyncrasies of, of a particular case and a particular killer, you might want to hypothetically apply the motive to some other high-profile killer. If it fits someone else, it's more than likely too general and not accurate. Spoiler alert. Serial killers often have rather typical motives. There is this perception that they may be insane or mentally ill. But I think that's what's even scary is that they, they aren't. In fact, some of their motives are touchstones for what we feel, sometimes through the course of an average day. Obviously, their feelings are far more intense and their ideas far more extreme than ours. But the point is, it comes from the same wellspring the realization of a profound unrequitedness. There's something unsatisfied about the same feelings we feel, they feel, but there's a profound unsatisfiedness surrounding that. The most common motives among serial killers are hunger for power, need for notoriety, psychosis, revenge, sadistic pleasure. You might think that all of those motives are, strictly speaking, in the realm of a serial killer psychology, but all of us feel feelings of wanting to be more powerful than we are, wanting more agency than we have, wanting to be famous, wanting revenge or payback or settling of some score, even if it's a small thing on social media. Many of us take a small amount of sadistic pleasure in the uh, what's the word, in the suffering of people we don't like or have a grudge against. In my opinion, the Gilgo Beach killer has all of these motives to a varying degree. So hunger for power, yes. Need for notoriety, yes. Psychosis, yes. Revenge, yes. Sadistic pleasure, yes. But one can see how one of them rises to the top to become the summit, the peak of Mount Motive. Do you know which one it is? If so, let me know your answer in the comments right now. Write it down right now in the comments. Now, through this review process, you ought to have felt dozens of red flags rising and fluttering as we've touched on general aspects that are nevertheless specifically true and resonate with the Long Island serial killer suspect. But let's take it a step forward and deal with one of the victims through this prism of statistics and traits, and that is going to be Melissa Bartholomew. The fact that all the victims in this case are prostitutes should have alerted investigators right off the bat to a particular kind of serial killer, the sexual serial killer, arguably the most common. And now let's deal with Melissa Bartholomew. According to Wikipedia, Bartholomew 24 of Erie County, New York, went missing on July 12, 2009, She'd been living in the Bronx in New York and working as an escort through Craigslist. On the night she went missing, she met with a client. She deposited $900 in her bank account and then tried to get out of it. She tried to call an old boyfriend but did not get through. About a week later and lasting for five weeks, her teenage sister Amanda received, um, to quote what Amanda said, vulgar, mocking, and insulting calls from a man who may have been the killer, using Melissa Bartholomew's cell phone. The caller asked if Amanda was a W-H-O-R-E, like her sister, and you can tell by this language, vulgar, mocking, insulting, 
that it matches again those search terms we were dealing with. It's trying to inflict pain on someone and enjoying that process. It's kind of like being a bully, but a, 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 in a sexual sense. The calls uh, became increasingly disturbing, according to this Wikipedia article, right? So the, the calls also become, um, what's the word? They, there's a serial nature to the calls, and one can almost imagine the caller is perhaps getting sexual gratification in extending whatever experience he had to the sister, and by making these calls, he's also getting a sexual kick out of that. And what is happening here and what has happened in this person's psychology is they've tied the feeling of arousal to a kind of aggressive domination. They can't have the one without the other. Eventually, the caller told Amanda that her sister was dead and that he was going to watch her rot. You can see how sadistic it is. Police actually traced the calls to Madison Square Garden, Midtown Manhattan and Massapequa but they were unable to narrow it down. They were unable to find out exactly who is making them. It's not hard to tell what we're dealing with. It's a sexual sadist. For me, the more interesting question is, where did it come from? And now we deal with intertextuality up to a point. I think an interesting thought experiment is to ask how the motive here is different to the motive in the Idaho student case, because both motives and both killers are similar, but also clearly not the same. So how are they similar, why are they similar, and how are they not the same? As extreme as the Ido student killings are, there was no overt sexual component to them. Covert, in my opinion, yes, but not overt. And so strictly in that sense, the Ido student killer was a nicer killer, and I, I know what I'm saying when I say that, but I mean nicer in comparison to the Gilgo Beach killer, right? So you might say, nice? How? How is he or why is he nicer? Well, in my opinion, the one was hopelessly caught up in a particular kind of extreme pornography and also had serious self-esteem issues going back all the way to high school, along with some currently unknown family dynamic. We know that both prime suspects in both cases were bullied in high school. We also know that both were addicted to something. I presume... And obviously, an investigation needs to be done to find this for a fact. But I presume that the um, the serial killer was in a less functional family dynamic scenario than his than uh, the suspect in the Ido case. On the other hand, in the Ido student case, you have someone who is a lot less physically unattractive than the serial killer suspect in the Gilgo Beach case, but nevertheless found to be unattractive enough that he can't find the, the, the sort of uh, experiences and uh, partners that he's looking for. Okay, so this is the TCRS assessment. I came up with this assessment quite a few days ago. The motive here is lust for power. And those words are each carefully chosen. The killer gets a sexual thrill by feeling powerful and in mortal control of his victims. And conversely, by being in a position of absolute control, this turns him on. He feels powerful, enjoys this feeling of sexual agency, of sexual potency, of strength. Where does it come from? It comes from a reality where he was chronically deprived. Incidentally, he gets a little flick of enjoyment from shooting ducks as well, doesn't he? And so he wonders eventually if he pulls the feathers out of a person, if he has them lifeless or quivering like these birds bleeding in the boat before the final blow, how much better might that feel? Is that the source of the, is that the seed of the original criminal psychology? In an article in the US Sun, Maureen Holpert she shares her memories of high school with the Gilgo suspect Hewerman. She says that he was bullied. She says that she was um, nice to him because she didn't like seeing people bullied. And he misinterpreted that thinking that she liked him. And she describes boys, lots of boys, hurling insults at him uh, as he walked through the school's hallways. 
almost like every time he walked down the school hallways, he was running the gauntlet. She offered Hureman reassurance. Again, he mistook that for romantic interest. And so he would leave her notes. And on the note, it would say, do you like me? And there would be a box to tick yes and a box to tick no. And when she said she didn't like him or wasn't interested in him, he said he was fine. But obviously he wasn't fine. And if he seemed happily married and content on the outside, well, he wasn't fine with that either. He wanted more. He dreamed of more. He fantasized about having more. Eventually he decided to get more. And once he'd gotten more once, it felt so good he couldn't stop. And that's why I brought up this whole thing of Manhattan. Each day he went to work under the glittering cathedrals of Manhattan. And underneath them, he passed by shining champions of industry, men and women. Each time he looked up at those soaring towers, that feeling deepened. That lust for power. And all he had to do was set himself free and get what he wanted. I mean, isn't that the mantra of New York? You know, just go for it. Think big. And wasn't this his version of doing that? Does that make sense? Thank you for listening and I'll see you guys next time.